Hello and welcome back to this Down for the Dualistic Crusade. This is the latest in my seemingly never-ending Laserdisc collection update videos. So I picked up a number of interesting discs that popped up in local stores, and then as per usual with uh, some of the lots that get traded into our local stores, those couple discs grew into 5, 10, 15, and a few more than that, uh, particularly since uh, one of our local stores very occ occasionally gets in like another 20 or 30 discs, and they're all priced extremely low. And then our local store chain had gotten the big massive trade-in, uh, or, or I should say they, they purchased an entire collection of uh, an old video store of over 4,000 titles, and those keep getting put out piecemealed. So this is mainly from, well, actually, it's pretty much all from those two stores, but some really interesting things popped up and some things I've been waiting to check off my uh, wish list for quite some time. So the first is a box set, and I will get to unbox this because this is still sealed, surprisingly, but... And in, in my local store, in the little LD cubbyhole, all of a sudden popped up a couple of the classic Disney CAV collector's box sets, and all in really nice shape, and at the affordable prices they should be at. And it's getting harder to get these because you'll have people who buy them simply because they're Disney collectors or they love the films and they don't even own a player. And the boxes themselves are really beautiful display pieces. And of course it costs more to ship them and it's easier to get them dinged up because they're bigger boxes. So getting a nice minty, affordable, um, you know, under $20 copy that's still sealed in your local store, that doesn't happen every day. So this is one of the few uh, Disney titles I was still needing, and that is the beautiful archive edition of Alice in Wonderland. So this is in their classic archive series. It doesn't, it was before they transitioned over into the big fancy single film boxes like Sleeping Beauty with the full artwork. So it has the nice gold embossed foil, uh, for the title and the archive banner, an image from the film in the sort of same white box design as the archive box spine. And then we have the archive rear with the full and exhaustive special features. The film is entirely presented in CAV, and it has a number of vintage and then current uh, documentary materials and promotional materials from the time period. And it's in the big slide-out tray design, as all Disney boxes were. And as you can see, it's still sealed. So now I get to do an, a Laserdisc unboxing, which is something I don't get to do all the time, because I'm not specifically looking for sealed discs most of the time. So if we can open this up and let all that fresh 90s air goodness out. Forgive me as I try to do this on camera. I know it's riveting. But with fancier boxes like this, I try to just open them carefully and then leave the actual shrink wrap on the outside. So I just try to cut a slit in the side so I can just slide the tray in and out. Which, of course, sounds nice, but is easier said than done, particularly when you decide to do this on camera. So, of course, I've now created a nice little flap on the side so I can just easily slide out the tray. And like most of these, because there's so much in terms of the contents and it's so heavy and it's slid around slightly all the years, you'll see here where the little uh, finger hole is, there is a little tiny bit of stress wear. I don't know how clear that is, but... That's pretty common on all big Laserdisc box sets, and particularly when it's a nice slide-out tray like these Disney boxes, but that's to be expected. That's nothing bad. As usual, nice, really sturdy Disney box. Very hard. You can literally knock on it because it's so thick and sturdy, which means all the contents inside are packed pretty tightly. We have the beautiful booklet which is on nice thick cardstock. This is very much full collector quality. And then you have the, the lovely uh, character drawings underneath the uh, front cover reproduction. Again, all very nicely printed. Then you open it for the typical archive collection type essay with beautiful photos. And if this hadn't made it clear to you, this was intended for adult animation collectors and animation fans and diehard Disney fans, you get to the rear where you have the chapter selection and you get one of these beyond stuffed Laserdisc uh, contents breakdown list. 
So since it's such fine print, I'll put up a photo and I'll just read off to you what this contains. So the film is in full CAV. It's contained on the first three sides. The digital track is the new restored version of the original mono. The analog left has the original unrestored mono track. And then the analog right track includes the restored music and effects isolated track, which is also mono. Then side four is in CAV, and it picks up with the supplemental section, which includes the history of Alice in Wonderland, which talks about previous adaptations, uh, earlier uh, Disney productions dealing with classic Lewis Carroll stories and the Alice in Wonderland tale itself, uh, bits of storyboards and deleted sequences from the film, design concepts, character designs, the main title design, a really detailed photo gallery, a bit on the actual voice talent of the film, the publicity, the ad campaign materials, then in an entire chapter you get original and reissue trailers for the film, plus it closes out with uh, the actual original Disney television airing introductions for the film in the uh, 50s and 60s. Then side 5 and 6 are CLV and includes the vintage 1950s uh, uh, Walt Disney television special on the film and showing clips from the film. It does say that they basically inserted the film clips from the new restored color master because originally it was broadcast in black and white. Uh, so that's a wonderful historical artifact being preserved uh, as part of the Laserdisc package. Then it includes the original 1951 promotional film talking about Alice in Wonderland and then another vintage television piece about the making of the film. Then in terms of the audio tracks, the digital, I believe, is uh, using the is the um, is the program audio for the uh, supplemental sections of five and six for the programs. But then the analog tracks have a full breakdown of additional audio only material in terms of really detailed uh, chapter breakdowns. These are all uh, seemingly pretty much various instrumentals, alternate takes of songs, uh, songs with vocals. Uh, different mixes of a lot of the music and material, so you're able to really experience the composer's work uh, in different ways on its own. It also includes vintage uh, radio broadcast versions uh, that Disney made of the film. Uh, ultimately, this is a stuffed section that runs through the entirety of the rest of Side 5 and Side 6 on the audio portion, so this is very much in keeping with what you get in an archive release. So you can definitely tell this was an archive collection release, and uh, it just just uh, the definitive presentation of the film on Laserdisc for sure. I believe most of this stuff carried over to a lot of the DVD and later releases of the film, but uh, like with most really stuffed LD box sets, it's frequently possible, if not very likely, that not 100% of everything made it over. I'm not entirely sure because I don't own a lot of the later releases or things, but uh, this, this is definitely intended for the adult animation fan and collector. Of course, we have the highly collectible, uh, unfilled mail-in card thanking you for purchasing and asking you to fill out the survey. And as always, I wonder what would happen if I filled this out and sent it in to the Disney company. Hmm. Did you receive this Laserdisc as a gift? How did you first discover this Laserdisc was available for purchase? What, what is the one main reason you purchased this Laserdisc? And of course, it gives a bunch of reasons, and it lets you select other, which of course I would select because of the company's seemingly unending revisionism. <laughs> so, what was the name of the store where this Laserdisc was bought? Well, uh, the, the, unfortunately, none of those stores would be in existence still. And then, what price did you pay for this Laserdisc? Um... Yeah, I don't want to know what I would have had to pay for this in the 90s. Uh, probably quite a lot. Uh, then, yeah, it gives all kinds of fun stuff. Do you also own a VCR? Uh, so, yeah, it would be fun to fill one of these out sometime and find, like, the updated modern address and just send it in to see what would happen. So I might do that sometime just as a gag to just fill out one of the uh, Laserdisc mail-ins. Then underneath you have the collectible foam insert. I I just I love saying that I I think it was Sam Hatch at Culture Dog who came up with that particular terminology, but it just got stuck in my head because you always get the foam inserts in LD boxes, but with the lovely uh, custom labels. So that is the archive box set of Alice in Wonderland, one of the stuffed signature box sets from Disney and on the Laserdisc format. 
the premiere release of the film on Laserdisc. Still a fantastic piece for collectors and Disney fans, and this is just inching me one step closer to having all of the uh, classic Disney animated feature library on the nicest Laserdisc editions. And then I also picked up some nice Criterion titles as I inch closer to having uh, at least, well, I'm not going for Spine Complete, but uh, I guess maybe one day I, I, I might since I have a nice number of criterions now. This is Spine 126, a real classic, and uh, getting this in terms of it being the fully restored version was really something. And that's the 1941 William Dieterle version of The Devil and Daniel Webster, with the iconic Walter Houston giving it his all in just a magical film experience. Uh, for many decades, this film was only available in a severely cut-down version. Uh, this was the restoration attempt that had to mix and match materials to reconstruct the original running time, uh, which basically added a little over tw of 20 minutes back to the feature. It had been cut down to, I think, about 84 minutes, and this puts it back to about 160 six minutes. This is the Criterion Edition with PCM Mono and a Bruce Eater commentary, which uh, this this all got ported over for uh, Criterion's uh, DVD release, but I've always been curious about the Laserdisc, so uh, finding this was, was a real nice find locally, and I can't wait to spin this up. It seems a perfect film for uh, the upcoming October classic horror season. Uh, it slots in rather nicely, and it's a wonderful film to come back to. Uh, it's just a, a film I really hope gets a Blu-ray release. I could see Criterion doing this as a Blu-ray. I really hope they do because I would love to see this film in HD from a new scan and restoration. This has the little paragraph in here about the uh, restored footage being of varying quality, and of course that's just what they had to deal with at the time. I believe it was further massaged and cleaned up more for the Criterion DVD release later on. Uh, it's just a single CLV disc, and the main extra is the Bruce Eater commentary. Next is Spine 164, and it is one of the true cinematic classics that is severely underappreciated. And this is really the film that helped to uh, basically lay the groundwork and lead up to one of the greatest films ever made, The Third Man. So, of course, I'm talking about 1948's The Fallen Idol, directed by Carol Reed, uh, written by Graham Greene. This is an incredible film that I would not spoil for anyone who has never seen it. Basically, if you've seen The Third Man and you've always been curious about other Carol Reed films or films with similar feeling or adapted from Graham Greene stories, this is a must. It's another of the absolute masterpieces that Carol Reed made. It's an incredibly beautiful, incredible film experience uh, full of genuine human emotion and unbelievable suspense uh, that is generated from the, uh, the the central plot. Again, I don't want to really spoil this or describe the plot in any detail because uh, that really that first time experience with this film really will cement it in your mind forever. This is a lovely Criterion edition. It has PCM mono, but unfortunately no extras. But getting this film in a nice print on video uh, at this time was really something. They eventually did do a, uh, a DVD release, and I keep hoping somebody will do this film as a beautiful 4K restoration. It just hasn't happened yet. But again, the, the cover is really beautiful using the whole jacket, and the black Criterion banner goes perfectly with this beautifully chosen image so it was really nice to find this uh, it's one of the criterion titles i've always wanted to find next is spine 237 the 1945 classic from the archers i know where i'm going on this really stunning looking criterion jacket this is a full-blown gatefold special edition again really beautiful art so this is an example of criterion really doing the archers right back in the Laserdisc days and with such a beautiful package that I think it still remains an essential LD to hang on to, not just because it's the Archers, but because the production is so excellent. The gatefold is absolutely beautiful with the mixture of black and white and color overlays for the imagery. Really nice layout. This is where Criterion is really changing over into a more modern style and using the LD jacket dimensions much better. 
the film is spread out across, uh, well, the film is only on the first two sides, and then the end of side two into side three has the uh, pretty extensive extras, so this is a full-blown special edition. The special features include a, a new audio commentary by Ian Christie, who also writes the uh, the rear jacket essay. Then it has behind-the-scenes stills and, and footage uh, which narrated by Thelma Schumacher, who was uh, Michael Powell's wife later in his life. Then it also includes a 1994 documentary about the film uh, by Mark Cousins. Then it also includes excerpts from Powell's 1937 feature film, The Edge of the World, and uh, footage from a 1978 documentary, Return to the Edge of the World. And there's also a brand new photo essay in the supplements uh, by Nancy Franklin, who explores the modern locations of the film. So it's basically, I guess, a, a locations then and now comparison. And then it's also got uh, home movies of Michael Powell exploring Scotland, uh, narrated by Thelma Schumacher. So uh, that's that's a really uh, it, this is a full blown special edition with a brand new transfer, which is credited as a new digital transfer manufactured from a 35 millimeter preservation print recently manufactured by the BFI from the original nitrate elements. And it is approved by the original director of photography. So they had the cinematographer actually sign off on the transfer. The rear is really nicely done. I love the, the layout and, and the color, and it looks really nice. So this is a beautiful, full-blown special edition for an Archer's Classic from Criterion. And I think uh, all the effort and the packaging put it over the top. So this remains one of the really lovely Criterion Laserdiscs to have in your collection or to hang on to, even if you've upgraded this to later and more modern versions of the film. should also, of course, mention that the film's mono is in PCM and the audio commentary is on the analog track. Next is Spine 259, which is the release of the David Lean-directed Hobson's Choice starring Charles Lawton. This is a really striking cover. This it was made in 1995 by Criterion when they had, by this point in time, there was nobody approaching them in terms of creative and really eye-catching uh, Laserdisc jackets. So this one really looks nice on an LD jacket. This was a brand new transfer of a new print made directly from the original negative and has a really nice Criterion essay on the back with this really colorful and eye-catching rear cover. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a special edition, so there are no extras, but you get the new transfer of the film as a single CLV disc and a PCM mono soundtrack. So I've been wanting to revisit this film for some time, so it'll be interesting to check it out on the Criterion Laserdisc transfer. Now to move on to standard discs, but first I'll talk about uh, discs for my director's shelf. This first one is one I've wanted to pick up for some time, but then unfortunately uh, Peter Bogdanovich passed away uh, not too long ago, and I started looking back over his filmography, and uh, most, of, most of his films are not readily available or have rights issues or are in out-of-print editions or there's different cuts like the director's cut of Texasville. So I was very happy to find this in the bins. Uh, this is his 1993 film, The Thing Called Love, and the uh, widescreen edition from Paramount. It's not a very common disc, so I was very happy to find this just mixed in with a bunch of commons. Uh, it's a nice widescreen pressing, nice colorful art on the jacket. It has the original Dolby Stereo mix with surrounding coding as PCM on the digital tracks. And of course, is nowadays probably most well known for being a film starring with the late River Phoenix. So I, I had seen this a long, long time ago, and I only faintly remember it. So I had had it on my uh, my watch list as I've been going through uh, Bogdanovich's features again. Some I hadn't seen for a long time, some I've never seen. So uh, this one, I was very happy to find the LD of because it's, again, not a super common film. It doesn't have a Blu-ray release, and so I figured it would be fun to watch it on the Laserdisc. And again, it's not a very common disc, so it was nice to find floating around in the bins. Next, for my Michael Curtiz shelf, they had a, a really nice minty copy of the original MGM pressing of Mildred Pierce from 1945, uh, one of the most famous Joan Crawford films uh, based on the James M. Cain novel. Uh, this is a classic noir, uh, the, one of Crawford's standout films and one of the greats from the legendary Michael Curtiz. This has what the art they used for the VHS, but of course on a full laser disc jacket with a nice bit of gloss on the cover. It's an absolutely perfect shape. 
Uh, this is one where they don't indicate if it has digital sound, so I'm pretty sure this is analog only. And so I had never intended on picking it up, but it was less than a dollar, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm weak when I find minty LDs for a quarter. So naturally, I couldn't resist picking this up and at least checking out the transfer, and of course having the lovely jacket helps as well. Uh, it's the standard MGM type of the late 80s in terms of the cover design. We just have the chapter breakdown on the back and then the general write-up that's been resized from the VHS rear cover. But otherwise, it's a really nice looking LD and uh, should be a pretty solid print transfer from the late 80s, early 90s era. But with a beautiful cover like this and uh, finding one really cheap that was not beaten up, uh, I couldn't resist. Next for my shelf of Delmer Dave's films is his 1959 film, A Summer Place, which he actually wrote, produced, and directed. This is a Warner Brothers release, but surprisingly, it's got a beautiful, glossy, full cover shot in color across the jacket no silver bar or anything uh nothing wrecking it so this is one of the nicest warner jackets for a catalog title in all of laserdisc for the the main run before the uh the the late days or past the mid 90s because you flip over to the back and it's your standard black with silver bar warner brothers cover so it's it's a really deceptive looking cover uh you have the traditional uh, black information with your chapter stops and then the shots from the film on the silver bar on the on the side. Like most Warner discs, there is no technical information. So this is unfortunately a pan and scan transfer, but it does have uh, digital audio uh, included. So it has the original audio as PCM, but it is unfortunately a pan and scan transfer, but it's such an uncommon disc that I figured I might as well pick it up. This goes uh, for my shelf on Edward Dimitri. So this is the 1945 war film Back to Bataan from Image on a really lovely jacket. Beautiful original artwork, even though the rest is the standard Image jacket. It has a very thick gloss on it, so it has a nice premium feel. This is a John Wayne uh, World War II vehicle, and of course co-starring Anthony Quinn. I've seen this once before, but I'm curious to check it out on the Laserdisc presentation. This also has digital sound, so it has the original mono as PCM. Obviously, resized from the VHS release. It's a typical no frills image jacket, but again, it looks really nice because it has such a thick gloss on it and the images are really good and especially the beautiful poster shot there. Next is the Edward Dimitrik directed classic Western Broken Lance from 1954. This is a Fox widescreen title. It is an early Cinemascope film, so it also includes a stereo surround encoded mix, uh, which should be based on the original four-track Cinemascope uh, magnetic stereo audio. So you'll be able to use Dolby Surround uh, decoding to have a four-track version of the film. It's a standard Fox jacket, so you get a nice widescreen formed image on the cover with the classic black and gray and the Fox widescreen banner. This does have a nice gatefold with the usual Fox write-up and essay with lovely full color stills and nice text about the film. Unfortunately, as you can see, this copy was actually hole punched at some point, and that is through the whole cover. But otherwise, it's an absolutely mint shape with no creasing or tears or any sort of wear. The rear has the traditional gray Fox rear with the chapter stops. The film is a single CLV disc on uh, with uh, two sides. And again, the PCM audio is stereo uh, and, and surround encoded, so it should be the original four-track Cinemascope mix. Uh, the film was released by Fox on DVD with a newer transfer, and it did get a newer transfer on a Blu-ray release. But I was curious to check out the laser disc and see how it stacks up. Plus, I really find it fascinating looking at early widescreen transfers of early widescreen films. And this is, of course, an early Cinemascope film for Fox. Next, for my John Ford shelf, this film needs no introduction. This is the standard Fox release of 1946's My Darling Clementine. In keeping with their other Ford releases, it's just a standard CBS Fox release with the blue banner on the bottom, a lovely black and white still chosen for the cover. It's got a nice gloss to it, so this is a very nice displayable jacket. It's a single CLV disc with the film across two sides, and it does have uh, the original mono as PCM, so that's a nice bonus, uh, but it will be a print transfer of whatever they could get their hands on at the time. So 
the uh, releases like this of the four titles I've seen, they can vary in quality, but usually they are rather nice presentations done at, at the time as, as best as possible. And it you don't see these pop up all the time. And then usually when they do, they, they have a little bit of markup because they're John Ford and they're famous films and they have the really nice covers. And it's hard to get one without seam splits and creasing and cover wear. So it's a really nice uh, thing to find one of these for cheap uh, floating around in the bins. And of course... The jacket is gorgeous. Next is another Ford classic. Doesn't get discussed as much as it should, and it's a film I own on DVD in the Warner Archive Blu-ray, and now Laserdisc too. So they had the RKO Classic Collection version of the 1950 Wagon Master. So this is in the same cover design as all the RKO discs. You have a nice production still with the uh, with the title in blue, and then everything else in blue, black, or gold. But unlike almost all of these, this actually has a full gatefold with a complete essay and stills that run entirely across both panels. This is a really wonderful Laserdisc gatefold, and it is easily one of the most impressive packages of the entire Archeo Classic collection that Image did, because again, almost all of these were just standard jackets with you know no frills and as most Image discs were. So this was something, I didn't even know this had a gatefold, so it was a real surprise to pick this up and suddenly realize I had a gatefold and open it to find this inside. The rear is the same standard design as all the RKO discs, licensed from Turner Home Entertainment. Uh, it's just the film only with a PCM mono soundtrack. It'll be a print transfer from the time period. This copy is in really nice shape. The only trouble is it does have the dreaded punch hole, so this must have been on sale as well at some point. I don't know why they, they would do that to Laserdiscs and, and uh, records back in the day, but uh, it, it's still otherwise in perfect shape, so it doesn't attract too much from the lovely jacket. Next, I found a number of Don Siegel titles, and most excitingly, they had the RKO Classic Collection disc of the 1949 The Big Steel, which Siegel directed, and this is pretty much a follow-up to Out of the Past. You have uh, Robert Mitchum and Jane Greer reteaming, along with the uh, the script was uh, partially written by Jeffrey Holmes, who also worked on Out of the Past. So this is the, the story and vibes. It is a full-on film noir, and with everyone sort of being reteamed after the success of Out of the Past, it very much has that sort of continuation feeling, even though it's not obviously a direct sequel in any way. So if you're a fan of Out of the Past, and you should be because it's one of the greatest films ever made, uh, this is a must. It's a heck of a lot of fun, and it is a true classic noir. And it's fascinating to see earlier Don Siegel films other than his more famous later films. This is otherwise a standard RKO disc, film only from a print transfer, but it does have PCM mono audio, and it is getting harder to find the RKO disc, so it is nice to find these. And also, this was one of the DVDs that I had uh, rot in the uh, Warner Brothers Film Noir uh, Classic Collection Volume 4, so I did get replacements for most of those, but there's still a couple discs I'm having to track down, and uh, I thought it would be interesting to compare this to the uh, to the replacement DVD I've finally gotten for that. And uh, but it was still cool to find because I love this film and uh, again it's it's pretty much uh, if if you're a fan of Out of the Past then this is an absolute must. Next they had this really minty copy of 1968's Coogan's Bluff. Uh, really lovely artwork. Unfortunately, it's just a standard MCA Universal disc at the time, so it is a. Uh, it's not widescreen. It's one three three, so it is essentially a cropped and open matte version of the original widescreen. The rear cover looks rather nice. It's it's a nicer looking uh, Universal release from this time period. And like most of their discs, it rather nicely tells you the chapter stops. Side one, none. And side two, it'll let you play the trailer, which is included. So the film has no chapter stops. Uh, it's just a single CLV disc. And this is unfortunately analog only, but it should be the original mono. And uh, at first I was going to, I didn't see a reason why I might need to pick this up, but it was in perfect shape. The cover looked so nice, and it was less than a dollar, so I figured I'd pick it up and at least look at the transfer, maybe compare the audio to the Blu-ray I have. And I really love this film. It's it's definitely the film that laid the groundwork for uh, Eastwood reteaming with Don Siegel to make Dirty Harry just a short while later in 1971. And it's a really enjoyable classic that doesn't get discussed in the way it should. It's a really strong film in Siegel's filmography. It's one of Eastwood's best star vehicles um, once his American career really took off. And again, 
the LD jacket looks really, really nice. Next is the 1970 film they made together, which is, of course, The Beguiled, the really striking and very dark uh, Civil War set drama that, of course, was recently remade by Sofia Coppola. But uh, this this is still an incredibly harrowing and dark film and very daring for uh, Eastwood to do as a star vehicle, uh, beautifully directed by Don Siegel. This LD has really striking art. Uh, the, the, the actual color really jumps out at you when you pick it up and hold it in your hands. This is a nicer disc because it was actually made in 1992, so it has the trappings of a usual MCA Universal disc, but it is a quite a bit nicer. But the jacket is very frameable and displayable and looks wonderful using a version of the original poster artwork. The rear is, uh, you know, a little on the plain side, but it carries the lovely bold purple across. The film is spread across two sides, but unfortunately, like most Universal catalog titles, it is not in its original widescreen aspect ratio. So this is essentially a slightly cropped or opened up version to the 1.33 television dimensions. So obviously you want to see this film in widescreen, but the presentation should be really nice because it's a 1992 pressing. Most importantly, this has the film's original mono as PCM, so it has a digital soundtrack. So I picked this up to check that out and compare it to the Universal Blu-ray I have, and also because it was so cheap, and this is not a common disc, especially to find it in perfect mint condition. So I think this is one of the best jackets Universal ever did on Laserdisc. I mean, this thing is stunning, even though it has the the typical universal black or colored bar with the title on the top, which is unnecessary unless you're flipping through discs in a box. But still, even with that and the universal logo, I mean, that's a jacket. That's a cover image and just an absolutely beautiful jacket completes this, even if it's not a, a fancy release or a letterbox release as it should be. But this is an incredibly strong film, and I just love what they did with the artwork. Next is a Preston Sturges classic, which is in another Universal edition. This is the encore edition of the classic The Palm Beach Story, with the art, same art used for the VHS release. It's a really lovely jacket, and although this doesn't indicate it, this actually does have digital sound. So the original mono is PCM here, and it should compare rather favorably to the later uh, Blu-ray releases. Of course, a number of the classic Sturgis films are now available on Blu-ray and nice restorations, uh, and they're on Blu-ray from Kino and Criterion and other labels, but uh, you can't go wrong with any Sturgis classic. I mean, these, these films are timeless, and so I was very curious to check out the Laserdisc transfer. Uh, we do get the theatrical trailer at the end. Universal kindly gives you the chapter for that. And then they give you a, um, a chapter one for side two for the, for the uh, notable song included in the film. But other than that, there are no other chapters. This is still a Universal Encore edition. But it is a nicer jacket, and this was at the time where they were finally starting to add digital sound to disc. Next for my shelf for the great Raoul Walsh is the true classic masterpiece, the Roaring Twenties from 1939. This is the nicer spiffed up laser disc from 1991 from MGM UA with the beautiful shot of Cagney and Bogart on the front wielding guns and fedoras tilted to one side. This is just a fantastic laser disc jacket. This was also used for the VHS release. The film has been released by Warner Brothers on a nice DVD, but it hasn't gotten a Blu-ray yet, which I hope the Warner Archive does. So I grabbed this because I always wanted to get this release because of the beautiful jacket artwork, but also it has a PCM mono soundtrack and I'm curious to see how the transfer and audio compared to the DVD release. The film is a single CLV disc, two-sided, lovely images on the back because this is not a gatefold. Obviously, it's a single disc release, but it's one of the much nicer MGM UA classic releases of a single disc uh, title in terms of it not being a gatefold. So it's a much nicer jacket than you usually get, even though it's film only. And it does include the original trailer, which is always nice. That didn't always happen back then, but that is a laser disc jacket. Then last for the director's shelf, I have a really rare title. Unfortunately, it's not a fancy release and this film never got a letterbox transfer on Laserdisc, but this is a very uncommon uh, title in, on the format. That's the 1965 William Wyler film, The Collector, with uh, the wonderful Terrence Stamp. This is an incredibly dark and daring film for the time period, and particularly coming from William Wyler, who you wouldn't think of making a film like this, but this is an incredible 
incredibly striking and memorable film, extraordinarily dark for those who haven't seen it. Uh, this is the image laser disc presentation, so obviously it's got their traditional uh, disc mock-up cover with VHS artwork re, uh, recentered on a laser disc jacket. So it's not fancy. Unfortunately, it is not the original ratio. It is uh, essentially open matte, unfortunately. So it is in the one three three or four by three ratio. The rear is the standard image jacket as well. The, you get some nice images from the film. It does have a nice little bit of gloss on the sleeve, so it feels a bit fancier. And it does have PCM mono, so it has the original audio. It has digital sound, which not every image disc did. So that that's a nice touch. And I will be comparing this to the DVD and other releases. But still, finding this floating around in the bins, this is a rather uncommon laser disc to say the least, even though it's not the optimal presentation because it's not letterbox. But again, this is an incredibly daring and dark film for William Wyler at this time. And uh, it was incredible to find the laser disc release just floating around because again, this is a very uncommon disc. Next, a super late release, very uncommon, just uh, happened to be sitting there in the bins. The 1999 Warner Brothers late release of the 1943 war film Baton, starring Robert Taylor. Really beautiful uh, full cover artwork. This is a very uncommon late release when they were doing these classic titles as part of the final waves of Laserdisc. The rear is really nice, uh, befitting it being a late release. This is pressed and manufactured by Image because they had taken over all of Warner's Laserdisc releases. And it is uh, film only, though it does include the original trailer. But I'm most excited to spin this up and check out the transfer and the fact that it's a 1999 pressing. It does include the original mono audio as digital PCM and should compare favorably to this film's version on DVD, which should be the exact same master. But I couldn't believe that this 1999 late release was just hitting, uh, floating around in the bins because... You don't find stuff like this every day. Next is the image release of the 1945 Rene Claire directed version of the classic story, and then there were none. Still, the, the it's the first major film adaptation of the famous Christie novel, probably her most famous work, uh, and still really is the best film version. It does make a few tweaks and changes to the story, particularly the ending, but it still remains, I think, the most effective and best version of the often filmed story. Uh, this is still a classic mystery, even for non-Christie fans, and of course, it, the story idea has been done to death so many times in other ideas that and stories that it is sort of a cliche in and of itself, but this is still the best mounted film adaptation, beautifully shot in black and white. The image cover uses what they used on the VHS. Uh, this is also licensed with VCI. The film has had a number of public domain releases as well because the rights have sort of uh, varied, and so most transfers or releases of this look and sound terrible. Uh, I did finally get a uh, Blu-ray release from VCI, which is the best you can do these days, but I'm curious to see what the Laserdisc transfer looks like, and it's not a super common disc either. It does have PCM original mono, so this is an image disc with uh, digital audio. They're usually pretty good about that, but otherwise it's just a standard image disc of the film only. Next is the 1945 Lewis Milestone directed war film, A Walk in the Sun, with this beautiful uh, cover and edition from LumaVision Entertainment, who uh, would occasionally do really spiffy editions like this. Uh, I've never gotten to see this film before, but it's always been on my watch list, and of course Milestone directed the classic All Quiet on the Western Front, among many other really classic films and interesting war films like the Errol Flynn vehicle, uh, Edge of Darkness. But this is a really lovely Laserdisc edition with a full write-up from the famous critic Bruce Eder, lovely uh, notes about the cast, crew, and production, and it's a lovely uh, edition with chapter stops. It's a single CLV disc, but it does have PCM mono, so it actually has digital audio. This is just, again, a really impressive disc from LumaVision and a really impressive jacket, even if it's not a gatefold. So I couldn't resist picking this up because, again, I had not realized that this film had such a nice uh, Laserdisc edition, and that cover is really beautiful. Next is a film from 1952 that, um, to say I despise what this film represents is uh, an understatement. This is easily uh, one of, if not just about the worst film I own a copy of, simply due to why it was made. It's one of the films made in the onslaught of the witch hunts of the HUAC trials, and uh, it's one of the most notorious, uh, you know, anti-communist films in terms of making its uh, message extraordinarily uh, obvious, and the, the film itself is, is quite dumb and stupid and insulting and 
really terrible in every way, but it's it's fascinating to look at why it was produced and how it was made. Uh, this is very much in the uh, in the same vein of the very attention grabbing titles that you'd see produced at this time period. But this was the big John Wayne vehicle. Big Jim McLean from 1952, where essentially John Wayne goes to Hawaii and ferrets out supposed communist spy rings and punches a lot of dudes. I mean, it's it's really as simple as that, unfortunately. But it's the ideas behind it and what it represents that are really reprehensible and terrible. So I really thought about not actually getting this, but again, it's not a common LD, and I only saw it once before, and it was many years ago, so I figured I would try it again on Laserdisc, because this does actually have a rather straightforward but okay-looking Warner Brothers rear jacket. It does actually have PCM audio, even though it doesn't indicate it, but the real saving grace, if there is any in this film, is that the uh, the female lead is played by the great Nancy Olsen, coming right off of her great turn in the classic Sunset Boulevard, and she later bemoaned the fact that she decided to do this film. Uh, she thought, oh, I get to do a John Wayne vehicle, and it turned out to be this thing, and then she's like, oh, crap. So um, if you ever wondered why she was in this film, well, that's that's what happened. But yeah, I, I will be revisiting this film on, on LD, and I'm sure I'm going to be gritting my teeth through the whole of it because I re- I've only seen this once before, but I remember it being really dire and terrible because it is one of those films that is very much promoting HUAC as a good thing. And uh, for, for that, it's like, you know, if you ever had to bury any film, well, you know, this would definitely be something you would not want to ever reference again. But it is easily one of the worst films that I now, uh, that is in my collection. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an artifact of its time. That is the, the best way to describe this thing. Now on to a good John Wayne vehicle from 1955. We have the Sea Chase, where he's paired with Lana Turner. This has the beautiful original poster artwork across the whole Laserdisc jacket. This is really uncommon for Warners at this time. It's not marred by any of their nasty banners or silver bars or logos. It's got a nice gloss to the sleeve, so this is easily one of the best early to mid-90s jackets on Laserdisc that Warner Brothers ever did. It's very much displayable. You can buy this disc just for the cover alone. But the rear looks rather nice in the typical Warner design. It is letterboxed. It's not set on the jacket, but it actually does have a digital PCM. I only saw this film once on TCM before, so it'll be really interesting to revisit it on this beautiful looking LD release. Next is the 1958 classic Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. This is the later newly remastered edition that MGM UA did. This came out in 1991. Lovely artwork, although you have the big title banner on the side, obviously just reusing the VHS dimensions. The rear looks quite nice, and again, this was a newer transfer, although you wish it had gotten a spiffy LD with the main original poster artwork, but still a nice-looking jacket, single-disc CLB release with PCM mono audio. However, this is not widescreen. It is 133 to 1, so it is not the original ratio, unfortunately, but uh, at least it is a solid, nice presentation of the film and a newer transfer. Next is the 1968 feature, the John Wayne vehicle, the Green Berets, which he also co-directed. This is based on the Robin Moore novel and has rather nice uh, cover artwork, especially for Warner at this time. I'm not really a giant fan of this film either because it does uh, seemingly to go for the, you know, the, the Vietnam War was great. And we, and I did, yeah, it just, you can definitely tell the mindset was, was a bit different. This is very much a, a pro military film at the time, which is, you know, it's, it's fine if you want to do that, but it does have a very um, obvious approach and mentality behind it. So, but again, it has been a long time since I've seen it. I only saw it once before. And this is a rather nice looking Warner disc from the time. It is actually a letterbox transfer. It is spread across three sides with side three being in CAV. And it does actually have PCM audio, though it doesn't indicate it. this has digital sound. So it'll be interesting to revisit it on Laserdisc after many, many years, because I only remember bits and pieces, really. And Rather amusingly, the color bar on the side, of course, they went with green. Next is the lovely Warner Brothers 1995 pressing of the 1985 Clint Eastwood Western Pale Rider with the lovely poster artwork on the jacket, really nice, thick, glossy cover, really nice premium feel, nice widescreen banner in the bottom corner. And then the rear has the nice, lovely imagery on the back, giving you the real 
Western flavor of the film, if you will, the sort of revisionist Western approach of this, which predates what you see in Unforgiven. Uh, it has the original Dolby Stereo mix as digital PCM. Otherwise, it's just a single CLV disc, but a really lovely presentation, and it's actually got the original scope widescreen framing. So this is the nicest version on Laserdisc, and it's a lovely 1995 spiffed up Warner Brothers pressing, but it's still movie only. Next is something I couldn't resist, even though it is totally, <laughs> I think this definitely qualifies as a Bruterian title, but this is the 1987 film I'd never heard of before entitled Codename Dancer. It's Kate Capshaw in an 80s spy sort of thriller with a silenced pistol on the cover and hair flowing, and it's also co-starring uh, Jérôme Crabbe, uh, and then also being from 87, same year he was doing The Living Daylights. Uh, so it just seemed too good for words, even if the film is terrible. Uh, this is a Vidmark release with digital sound, but it is a 133 transfer, I assume, uh, from an original 185 widescreen framing. So this would be an open mat transfer. But this is a rather, um, I've never heard of this film before, never seen the LD, doesn't seem to be a very common title. But again, it's Crabbe with Kate Capshaw with a gun. So. <laughs> Like, okay, I'm sold. Plus, it was uh, less than a dollar, so I, I couldn't resist, even though this is definitely uh, going to be something I'm probably going to watch for sheer enjoyment factor, not because it's a good film, of course, but I just I, I, I couldn't resist. This just looked too promising and interesting. Next from 1988 is one of the only good Steven Seagal vehicles, pretty much because it was directed by Andrew Davis, who would go on to direct Under Siege. So, of course, I'm talking about the Warner release of Above the Law. This has the full cover art version instead of having a silver bar. It's in really nice shape. It's a nice headshot, although it is very 80s, but it still looks really nice on an LD jacket. Unfortunately, Warner didn't put a lot into making these fancy laser discs, so it's just a single CLV disc, no credits for any information, but it does have the original Dolby Stereo encoded soundtrack, uh, but it's actually digital PCM, so it has digital audio. Uh, but unfortunately, this is open matted, so it's not a litter box transfer. I was just curious to see how this looked on LD, and this was finally a super nice copy for or dirt cheap. Next is the 1991 film Flight of the Intruder, the John Melius Vietnam film that didn't do very well, wasn't terribly well received, but something I've wanted to revisit it for a while, and it's got this really nice uh, version of the original poster on a widescreen jacket from Paramount, so it looks really nice. It's a lovely single-disc CLV title, lovely typical Paramount layout, has the original Dolby Stereo surround as digital PCM, and of course it's a letterbox transfer, so this is still a solid way to enjoy the film, and I've just been meaning to revisit this. I thought I had a copy, but apparently I didn't, and I looked at the database on my collection, so when this popped up for super cheap and it's in perfect shape, I figured I would pick this up and revisit this on Laserdisc. Next is the 1992 Bob Rafelson-directed Jack Nicholson vehicle, Man Trouble, I've never seen this before, but uh, it just seemed interesting. It's a rom-com, essentially, with Nicholson paired with Ellen Barkin and pairing Nicholson once again with Bob Rafelson, and they would later go on to make the interesting neo-noir Blood and Wine later in the decade. So it's interesting to see when they would get repaired after the early days at uh, BBS with films like Five Easy Pieces and King of Marvin Gardens. The rear is a nicer Fox widescreen edition. This has the Dolby Stereo encoded as a PCM, so it's got digital audio. It has a nice little bit of text write-up about the film, but otherwise is the film only as a CLV disc. But it doesn't pop up terribly often. It's, it's a relatively common disc, but it was in pretty nice shape for super cheap. It does have a little cutout notch on it, but otherwise it's in perfect shape. And again, I was just curious to see what uh, Rapleson and Nicholson did with a more straightforward comedy title. And then lastly, this is a super common disc that usually pops up in most bins, but it's a film I've never actually seen. And this was a super nice, mostly sealed copy for just a few cents. So I finally grabbed a copy of the Billy Crystal film, Mr. Saturday Night, which not only stars Crystal, but also was produced and directed and co-written by Billy Crystal. It didn't do very well at the box office. It's pretty well known. This film didn't do very well. But uh, still, it's an LD you see a lot. And as you can see, this is still pretty much sealed. It has split a little bit on the on the actual opening, but the seal is mostly intact and it was in perfect shape other than a cutout notch. But, you know, I've always meant to see this at some point and it does actually include a making of featurette on site three. The rest is CLV. 
but it's actually a Columbia pressing, so it's a Sony title. So it has a nice write-up, a nice rear cover. Uh, I do believe, though, that this is actually a 133 transfer. It's not letterboxed. It does have the Dolby Stereo track uh, as the digital track, so you can listen to this in uh, Dolby Surround. And again, it's a nice enough looking LD presentation. Again, it was just a few cents. I figured I would finally give this a whirl, and even though it's a super common LD title. So that's it for this particular video update on my Laserdisc collection. And again, as always, you never know what's going to pop up in local stores, so it was interesting to build a batch of titles for my next video, and then all of a sudden <laughs> a bunch of trades came in, and then I just saw all kinds of discs with my name all over it. So a few discs became 10, became 15, became, oh crap, I've got another box. Where in the heck am I going to put all these? So uh, as, as always, I hope this has been fun and informative, maybe encouraging you to check out some new titles on LD or dust some old favorites off the shelf you haven't watched in a while. Or if you're like me, if you have a massive to watch pile of uh, just seemingly endless numbers of films you haven't watched on disc yet, well, Maybe it'll encourage you to pull something out of the to, the to watch pile and actually spin it up. And as I always like to close out these videos, I'd like to say keep supporting your local independent record stores or video stores or comic stores or wherever you might find LDs. You never know what will pop up. So even if it's dried up in your local areas and you haven't found any discs in a long time, uh, you know it always pays to check out new areas or new stores or check your favorite local store out because you never know when some new laser discs might pop up. And uh, you know, happy laser disc hunting. Keep your players going, keep your disc spinning, and thanks ever so much for watching.